Well, I'm all in favour of tax cuts. The tax burden is too high. And uh, and I think the tax system needs to be flatter as well. And this did move it in that direction. But you've got to address the spending side of the ledger. It's not obvious to me that you can easily get economic growth just by borrowing for tax cuts. Welcome to the IEA podcast. My name is Matthew Ash, and I'm the head of public policy here at the IEA. Each week, this podcast asks a tantalizing policy question to a top policy and economic thinker. Today's question, has Trustonomics failed? The new government has gotten off to an undeniably rocky start. The pound, it seems, has been on a roller coaster. The, the cost of government yields, but borrowing has gone up. The IMF even has released a critical statement, and the Bank of England intervened in the gilt market. To discuss the, the last week and where to next, I'm very excited to be joined by the IEA's Director General, Mark Littlewood. Mark has overseen significant growth of the IEA during his tenure since 2009 and has been more recently highlighting some of the opportunities presented by the new government. Mark, just kind of an opening thoughts. What do you make of, of all the market chaos and mayhem? Uh, has, it, has it very much been overblown or is there a bit of a risk here that trust has gone a little bit too quickly in terms of some of her reforming instincts? Really interesting, Matt. Uh, I was expecting a choppy ride, to be honest, but not quite this choppy. <laughs> and um, for a free marketeer like me, it sounds a bit odd to say the markets are wrong, right? I mean, the markets can make whatever decisions that they want. The bit that has, I, I've got to be honest, confused me about it is what do we really think caused the markets to panic? And you might well blame that on the Chancellor or the Prime Minister, but it's important to understand what it is. Um, I think it clearly isn't the abolition of the 45p top rate of income tax, which is, I think, about a £2 billion um, tax cut, uh, dwarfed, of course, by the energy package. It seems to be almost that a protocol has been broken, that the government came up and announced its figures, but did not provide to the markets and the media an Office for Budget Responsibility Assessment or a nice little spreadsheet um, projecting what the numbers would be. Um, it seems to be that that's been one of the uh, big issues. I mean, there is a colossal amount of spending in it, although the tax cuts were what drew the headlines because we knew in advance really what the details and the costs were of the energy package. The biggest cost is the energy package. So it seems that the absence of some sort of independent fiscal audit panicked the markets. But um, also, to be sort of fair to the markets, and a criticism I would have of this government is we've only really heard one part of the three legs on the stool of trussonomics, and that was the tax cuts. Well, I'm all in favour of tax cuts. The tax burden is too high. And uh, and I think the tax system needs to be flatter as well. And this did move it in that direction. But you've got to address the spending side of the ledger. It's not obvious to me that you can easily get economic growth just by borrowing for tax cuts. But even if it was, where is all this money going to come from? So uh, I think that they didn't give a good enough account of themselves about where the matching spending cuts in real terms are going to come from. Uh, that, that I think, was problematic. But look, I, you know, I was expecting quite a lot of turmoil in a way. I didn't predict this level of turmoil this early. But I think if, if you have a government that is seeking to sort of move really the whole economic model of the United Kingdom in ways that, um, in a number of ways that those of us at the IEA, I think, would approve of, not necessarily all of the ways that they're doing it. Um, some areas we might want to go further. Some uh, we might think they're not addressing properly. But that's likely to be a tumultuous event. And so although the scale of this turmoil somewhat surprised me, the fact that we were going to have turmoil as trussonomics rolled out uh, hasn't really uh, phased me. Uh, the scale of it did. It seems to be calming down a little now, partly because of the Bank of England's intervention. Uh, but yeah, the scale of it, it's certainly been a pretty uh, tumultuous first few weeks for the new prime minister and the new chancellor, no doubt about that. Mm. I'm kind of interested in that, unpacking that first point you made a little bit more about what actually drove this chaos. And I, I think there's been some interesting analysis. I, ben, ben Southwood, uh, who, who I think used to be at the ASI, he, he made the point that you, we make all these assumptions that we understand what's driving the market and, you know, X caused Y. But in fact, the, the, the market has its own intelligence to it. This this was high X great insight, which is, you know, prices send signals. And often the the those who receive those price signals don't necessarily know what's what's led to it. You know, there's there's a there's a um a, a bad 
year of rain in a certain part of the world and that drives up the prices of crops and that means farmers see higher prices of crops they don't know why the prices have gone up then they plant some more crops and etc cetera, etc cetera. it seems in this particular case what we saw was uh, I don't, I don't know whether it was like the, the animal spirits at work with the pounds and then you had all these issues with gilts and, and the Bank of England intervened. And now you have some concerns about, I think the major concern now is about, to some extent, about rising interest rates. Now, a lot of this predates trustonomics, very much predates trustonomics. In fact, in, in some respects, um, pro- properly articulated, you, you could say that trustonomics is trying to solve some of these issues, particularly when it comes to um, uh, inflationary pressures. Did, did you get a sense there that, there's a bit of a risk here that trust is kind of by, I suppose, pushing the domino has, has taken responsibility for a lot more things than are necessarily rightfully her fault. Like interest rates, for example, are going up no matter what, but now it's, it seems like the government is getting the blame for interest rates somehow three weeks since the administration. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very fair point. And you're, you're right, Matt, to point out that moves in prices are, you know, influenced by a zillion different things um, and by a zillion different people who are influenced by different things as well. You know, some traders might not have liked the mini budget. Other traders might have taken the view that interest rates didn't go up high enough. There was a suggestion uh, that the rise should have been three quarters of a percent. Maybe, maybe the traders were worried about a Labour government and that's really what was Well, I, I agree. I've heard some <laughs> some um, some of those in the conservative interest trying to spin that. It's, it, it's difficult to uh, unpack it. And you're right that I think that we've been heading to this point for some considerable time, irrespective of the change in prime minister, right? We've been getting drunk on uh, easy credit for for years now, and that's beginning to come to an end. And it might be that that's coming to an end a little faster due to the economic policies of the trust administration. But um, I would have liked to have seen it start coming to an end earlier. I mean, I, I think we've had interest rates too low for too long. And to be blunt, the Bank of England hasn't done its job. It's supposed to use the interest rate tool to control inflation, and it hasn't. And now we're in the slightly odd position in which the government's loosening fiscal policy, but the Bank of England is finally tightening monetary policy. Um, so yeah, it's a whole, it's a range of different factors. Uh, Analysing it from the government side, I think that their um, their apparent determination not to have some sort of independent audit of the of the impact of the figures may have spooked a few people. Um, uh, but uh, I'm quite in favour of their determination to tear up what they call treasury orthodoxy. I'm not sure how much these OBR forecasts really turn out to be accurate at the end of the day. I guess they sort of prove the government's willing to have its homework marked. But if I recall correctly, and I haven't gone through all of them over the last 15 years, but there's been some degree of guesswork. The OBR forecasts X and you get anything from twice X to half X, right? So uh, it, it, it seems to me odd that that would have um, been a particular spook. But it might have shown people that the government just sort of didn't want to audit its fiscal credibility. And I do think a challenge for the government now is if you want to get debt down and the deficit down uh, and taxes down, you've got to at some point address the spending side of the ledger unless you think you've got some miracle cure for growth. Right. I mean, if they genuinely think that there's some deregulatory reform that can suddenly get us to two and a half percent per annum, that would mitigate a lot. Um, but uh, they haven't even laid those out yet. So I think that's what spooked people. But you're right to say there's a there's a million different things at work here. And because the spooking of the markets was sort of broadly coterminous with the mini budget, doesn't necessarily show total cause and effect. I don't think it was total cause and effect. Yeah, and I think what you get into is, is I suppose, some of the, I guess, the genuine and reasonable uh, criticism of what the government was trying to do, which is, you know, what what was the fiscal plan? Where was the fiscal plan? What I found though quite extraordinary during the week was some of the other criticisms, in particular the the IMF statement, which had a very heavy focus on the sense that uh, the fiscal statement increased inequality, and and therefore some of the measures should be reversed. Now, as far as I'm aware, the IMF's role is to encourage financial stability and economic growth. I didn't realize they had such a mandate around um, criticizing governments about the inequality implications of government policy. But what do you think is going on there? Is, is that just the kind of the blob, the, the orthodoxy fighting back as represented in the IMF? 
Well, a bit. And I've got I've got to confess on this. I, I, I've asked various um, journalists and policy advisors about the IMF intervention, and I'd rather taken my eye off the IMF ball in recent years. I didn't realise it had drifted into this sort of semi-ideological position. And I think that even if it uh, in its own mind is a completely objective and independent body, the problem with all of these organisations is you can't completely strip some sort of ideological view of the world out of the analysis you make. Uh, I mean, I've always thought that those who have worked at the OBR are perfectly well-intentioned, but, but you can't be wholly objective. It depends what sort of economic model you think prevails, right? Uh, how how important a second and third round effects on tax cuts, you know, genuine and sincere people disagree about this. I understand with the IMF that they have settled, uh, I stand to be corrected on this, I haven't read, read through it in great detail, but I understand they have basically happened upon a kind of spirit level type model, whereby inequality they consider to be bad for growth. Uh, QED, if a budget increases um, the Gini coefficient or inequality in any way, that would be bad for growth. Now, I, I'm not persuaded by that model. And I think it does just show that in this yearning for whether it's the IMF or the OBR or the Institute for Fiscal Studies, this sort of yearning for an absolutely independent audit or assessment, as if you can have a kind of economic equivalent of VAR in football that sort of exactly tells you mathematically where the ball has crossed the line. You can't really. Um, and I think the IMF has become uh, pseudo ideological, probably quite ideological. I don't think they should be intervening to pronounce to a country about its levels of equality. Uh, that's a matter for the electorate and the democratic system, not for the International Monetary Fund. Indeed. And, and you could even make a broader point that all these international organizations, in fact, a lot of central banks have talked about the need for structural economic reforms. And, and it's pretty much what the government's trying to get on with. But I think that kind of brings me to where to next for, for the government. Um, you've, you've kind of already mentioned the fact that, well, they, they need some, some plans on spending cuts. So why don't we go there first? Now, mm -hmm. I think in the abstract, as, as free marketers, we'd always like to see a smaller state, less government spending. But then in the practice, it's very hard uh, to go through, you know, been thinking about this this week, what you're going to do next. Um, today, there's there's a lot of talk about this idea that uh, the government might uh, not increase pensions or certainly not increase welfare payments by the full whack of 10% inflation. They might just do it by the increase in income levels. Now, distributionally, you know, we, we might say, well, we don't really care about the distributional consequences, but politically, at the very least, I think the distributional consequences could be quite toxic. And what mm. it appears like the government's doing is giving a huge tax break to the top end of town whilst reducing the, the rate of benefit increase or real terms cut in benefits. Where, where do, you, do you think the government's going to be able to make a case for spending restraints? Um, or is it, is it going to get bogged down in the arguments around austerity once more? Yeah, it's interesting. And I don't really know politically how it will play out, Matt. But I think you're right to say that cutting spending is always politically extremely difficult, right? We're, we can um, draw up our blueprints at the Institute of Economic Affairs or other think tanks can as well from a kind of blank sheet of paper sort of saying, you know, how would we completely redesign the healthcare system, the education system, the pension system, such that I don't know, I think in, in, in some of our sort of blueprints, state spending would only be, I don't know, maybe 25% of GDP, maybe 30% of GDP. And those are very useful academic exercises. But of course, we're not in the business of day-to-day -day politics uh, we're in the business of thinking the unthinkable and politicians are in the business of the art of the possible uh, I think that there's there's two ways that you can approach spending uh, restraint uh, and they're not mutually exclusive you can have a bit of each the first is that um, a potential benefit of inflation and there are not many uh, but a, a benefit of inflation is it does provide uh, a window a time horizon in which the default is it's easier to get public spending under control. So let's say that inflation is going to be seven or eight percent over the next year. Some people think it will be higher, some lower because of the government's interventions on energy. Um, well, you, you could just go for what they usually call efficiency savings. Every government departmental budget goes up by five percent um, in nominal terms. Inflation is seven percent. You know, hey, presto, in real terms, we've cut government spending by two percent. And you sort of leave it on each department uh, to work out where those efficiencies are, and you hope that they cut the fat, not the muscle. Um, I suspect the government will do quite a bit of that, so that departmental spending 
will not go up with inflation. Typically, public sector uh, pay, I think, will not go up with inflation. And therefore, in, you, you're making savings in real terms. That, that I'm not saying that won't be without conflict. I mean, witness quite a lot of public sector strikes, but you have the window to do that. The second approach, and as I say, they're not mutually exclusive, is you have a much more strategic view about what the government is and isn't going to do. And you sort of say, I don't know, you know, we're, we're, we're no longer going to get involved in culture, media and sport. So Channel 4 sold off and the DCMS has closed down. That wouldn't save you a huge amount of money, but it would be a strategic thought. Or that um, actually uh, we need to completely restructure the pension system. It's been a Ponzi scheme and we are going to end the triple lock on pensions or find some way, way to means test it. We're going to make big, big savings there or grandfather out some pension benefits or shove the pension age up to 69 or whatever in, 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 uh, or 70 in line with um, uh, life expectancy increasing. And I expect they're going to have to do a bit of each, right? And uh, oftentimes those who are um, interested in reducing state spending, I think don't have the honesty to say that the decisions really are difficult. You know, you can point, at, you can always find examples of of preposterous government waste. There's always stories in local government about absolutely madcap things that some cranky local councillors spent money on. And those should indeed be wiped out, but they only, oftentimes they only amount to sort of a hundred thousand pounds here or a million pounds there. I mean, real money to an individual, but not real money when you're trying to balance uh, the books and tackle an overall national debt with liabilities of maybe five trillion pounds or more. So I think the way to do it is the way they will do it. I would prefer a much more strategic approach with a comprehensive spending review that starts from first principles about what government should do and what it shouldn't do. And, you know, should folk certainly of your age, Matt, and probably of my age be now responsible for saving for their own pensions rather than expecting a state pension at the end of it funded out of basically general taxation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you one was in calmer waters, I think you could have that overall really long term strategic approach and think tanks engage in that likelihood. They'll do a little bit of that. They'll find areas of government spending that they really don't want to persist with. I don't know what those might be. Uh, and they'll but they'll make some decisions. No, the government's just not going to do this anymore. This program is shutting down is, is over. Uh, but more likely, they'll probably do most of the heavy lifting through saying inflation is X departmental budgets are going to go up by a bit less than X. Uh, consequently, we're going to save this number of billion of pounds in real terms. That's what I suspect we will get for the time being. Whether that's enough to calm jittery markets, I don't know. But you, you can potentially find, I don't know, a number of tens of billions of, uh, of of cuts through that sort of mechanism. What's the government spend in broad terms per annum? About, about a trillion pounds? Um, More or less, yeah. Uh, more or less. I mean, you, you you might be able to find, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 billion in efficiency cuts. I think the um, the longer term thing is, and I'm amazed almost the markets aren't more spooked about this, is uh, the liabilities that are going to hit us, not today or tomorrow or even next year, but over the next generation are just colossal. I mean, we it's very hard to see how we afford the public sector pensions that we've committed to. It's really, really hard to see where that money will come from, especially if you take the view that I guess folk like uh, you and I would take, Matt, that the economy was at or beyond its taxable limit. So it's very difficult to dial up taxes and expect much more revenue. We were probably at the kind of overall aggregate peak of the Laffer curve or near as damn it. You know, there's not much more you can squeeze out. We've had the highest tax burden uh, since the 1940s. So, um, but the long-term surgery again will probably have to wait given the, the position that the government now finds itself in. I do think certainly by their November the 23rd, are they calling it a budget or a fiscal event or a special mini budget operation? I think it just gets to be the proper budget, the real, the real, the real budget as opposed that, to the fake isn't budget. Isn't that in April? I, I've lost track now. It's so I think weird. this is meant to be year. two fiscal right. events a year or something. Or two anyway, three certainly, certainly in November, if not before, um, I think they need to give an indication of here are the savings. And, you know, that probably won't be as radical as people at the IA would like in our ideal world, but mm. might be enough to show that the fiscal position isn't worsening. I think that's the, the next step. And they haven't spelt that out yet, really. You kind of sense that Quasi Quarteng and Liz Truss want to spend less, but you know there don't seem to be any numbers on a piece of paper yeah. about that just yet. I mean, this was always one of the features of, of uh, trust in the leadership contest, which is she was always very keen to talk about tax cards. But naturally, when you're talking to Tory party voters, some of whom 
uh, or members even who on average are probably uh, lean towards the, the higher end and the later in life scale. It's very hard to tell them that you, you want to reconsider spending. I think that's an interesting point as well that it's not just that you could, I think you could probably make the most persuasive argument about what, what did, what did the chancellor effectively announce, which is he announced unfunded um, tax cuts, unfunded spending. Now there's the short-term implications of that and guilt go up and you, so you would expect so, but the, the longer term signal that he was sending was, I'm not really serious about fiscal sustainability and I'm just going to keep cutting taxes and I'm just going to keep going further and further and not take that fiscal question. So I wonder if what the government in a sense, needs to do to calm the markets, although it would be equally politically difficult, are dealing with things like what is the right pension age? Should we mean test the pension? Should the the bus passes? Does, 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 a, does, the, does a millionaire pensioner really need free buses? Is that, is that real? I, you know, it might be a, a few billion here or there, but it's just that general principle about what are we going to do with the long-term structural issues? Because what really scares me fiscally is not you know, a little bit of increased um, borrowing today, but it's a long-term trajectory. Mm-hmm. It's all the implications of an aging population when it comes to healthcare costs, when it comes to social care, when it comes to pensions. Combine that with reduced um, smaller numbers of people who are working, so a lesser taxable base, and you've got a completely disastrous um, fiscal consequences um, because yep. and when you haven't set up, you know, there's, there's no Norway-style sovereign wealth fund in the UK. Uh, that that would, could sustain us in the in the long run, and and that's really where I, where I think the fiscal issue lays. Uh, and I don't, don't know whether that's necessarily a solvable issue, but it's well, something I mean, obviously, that should what be they focus. Yeah, what they've said to date, and I have some sympathy sympathy with this. I, I really do because I think the government's onto something here. But it it might be again they haven't bottomed this out enough. Is if you have a plan to really go for growth and can get our long-term growth rates back up to, I think, 2.5% is the number they've picked. I'm slightly unambitious in, in, my, in my view, 2.5%. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, you know, that would be a, a very, very substantial improvement on what we've experienced over the last um, 10 or 15 years, uh, that they would argue that, all right, not today, not tomorrow, not next year even, but over the long term, if that's the long term, long trend uh, growth rates, 2.5%, a lot of these problems are mitigated. And they would be right. Um, tax revenues will increase if the economy is clipping along and growing at that point. Uh, presumably, if our welfare system works at all well, as people are getting richer, they will drop out of claiming welfare and will start to become net contributors in tax revenue. And that eventually, you're not in a year or two or even five or ten, but if you can get back onto that long-term growth rate, then you know these problems are substantially ameliorated. And I think they are right in that regard, that the big underlying problem in the British economy, although there have been many and numerous, um, is if only we'd had 2.5% or 3% growth over the last 15 years, rather than what we average, I don't know, one, one and a bit, then we wouldn't yeah. be in this problem. So let's make sure that the next 15 years aren't a repeat of these 15 years. And that sort of means a low tax deregulated economy. The problem that's very difficult to show and um, is what sort of modelling would, sh- would convince someone that the, these sort of plans might lead to growth. I, I don't think unfunded tax cuts are the best way of leading to growth. They might actually lead to a bit, but it's more of a sugar rush to the economy. But the, the third pillar of trustonomics, we touched on the tax side and the spending side, mm. is the sort of deregulatory yeah. side. And, you know, I'm confident that if you start liberalising planning law and financial services regulation and, you know, various other regulations that are presently choking the productive side of the economy, you, you will indeed see enhanced growth, that, that these regulations tend to dampen growth rather than encourage growth, and that there's a lot that could be stripped away. You don't need to absolutely torch everything, but you could ask yourself whether all of our planning regulations are quite necessary. Uh, somebody told me the other day that there's, if you want to build a house, there's basically, in effect, a 1,600-page manual of all the things you can't do. I mean, that's the scale of regulation. And you could surely pare that back a lot. But supposing there were lists and lists of these sort of deregulatory reforms, which I feel very confident will help economic growth, it's difficult to put a number on them, right? I, d- I don't know whether sort of planning reforms of type X or Y would lead to economic growth of going up by 0.1%, 0.2%, 0.3%. It's extremely hard to model those things economically. Whereas a static model of tax in spending out, which people appreciate doesn't really capture all the dynamic effects, but that's a lot easier to measure. So the problem the trust government's got is a kind of go for growth 
through in substantial part deregulation and presumably funded tax cuts rather than unfunded tax cuts but deregulation very hard to know how the OBR the IFS the IEA the IMF or anyone else would be able to sort of second guess those numbers it would very very much depend on your model and I think is extraordinarily uncertain although that's the general direction of travel I would expect if we start to pare back on the incredibly burdensome red tape that we've allowed to build up not just the stock but that we need to be very careful about the flow as well can we please stop you know regulating yet more sectors of the economy uh, so we don't dampen down growth further but how you put a number on that rather than the rather arbitrary sort of political target they seem to have picked of two and a half percent I really don't know and that's quite a challenge for this sort of new brand of trussonomics uh, which I think has got a lot of this right in its overall approach even if it's made some missteps tactically very 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 hard to quantify the 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 big things they're trying to do through deregulation it will be and i guess this is one reason why you might call it a gamble a bit of a suck it and see we'll get rid of these regulations in the confidence that growth will go up but by exactly how much and how quickly you know does it kick in after three months six months nine months nine years very 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 hard to measure but no, that doesn't mean it's not an important thing to do. I think deregulating the economy is a very, very important thing to do, but it's just extremely difficult to put on a spreadsheet what the consequences would be. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I think that the time is limited in some senses, because you, you could say, if, if I compare this to the moment when Thatcher came to power, she had a number of years in opposition to develop ideas. And then she won government had an, a number of years before the next election. And the run of the reasons why trust is moving so quickly, I think, is in the knowledge that we have to deliver some more growth before we next go to the electorate, which is you know, where, where I kind of want to end up here, which is ultimately this will work politically, economically, uh, if she can deliver that growth. Um, and where where are the, the, I suppose, lowest hanging fruit? Like what are the things we'd really like to see in terms of regulatory reform that although we, as you've said, Mark, we can't necessarily put a specific number on it, which is annoying, but we, we, we know to some extent that, or at least to a very big extent, um, they, these have an impact on, on investment and productivity in the economy. What, what, what is on your mind in terms of the priorities? Great question. And I'm going to give you two sectors rather than very, very specific regulations. Uh, I think planning reform is uh, urgent. And oftentimes that's spoken of in terms of the, the housing disaster crisis in the UK, that house prices are so high because we've sort of throttled the supply side. And that's true. But I think it goes rather beyond that. You know, it's it's far too difficult to change the commercial designation of retail premises and this sort of stuff. It's, it's I mean, the whole um land use system not just can we build more houses please that's probably the biggest element of it but you know how easily can you convert a wine bar into a bank or vice versa it's extraordinarily difficult to achieve that so i think planning reform to actually allow building and um and um the the reformation of our present stock um if you like which is which is also gummed up by the system i think that could unleash a lot of growth and the second area although this is probably large numbers of very fiddly regulations, is financial services. This is our most um, productive sector in the United Kingdom. If you really are wanting to see productivity rise and growth rise, you'd presumably look at the most productive sectors and what's holding those back. Financial services is sort of top in class for us. So I think we should look at Solvency 2, MIFID, GDPR, whether we really got the financial services regulations right after the banking crash. I don't think we did. Uh, I think we've moved to vast amounts of uh, tick box form filling and compliance for compliance's sake, rather than actually having a principled system that makes financial services sort of safe or, or more credible. In fact, if anything, I think it risks another, you know, full scale 2008 collapse so that every domino would go down at once. We sort of made, um, which we, we sort of seem to be trying to make banking safe, whereas actually what we need to do is to make bank failure safe. So if a bank goes pop, it doesn't bring down the entirety of the Western economy uh, with it. So those would be the two big areas I would focus on. But and again, in the planning side, there's much, there's much, much more than that. Am I right in saying we haven't built any new um, runway capacity in London or the south of England since towards the end of the Second World War or something? Is there something as bizarre as that? I mean, if, if, if I'm not yeah. quite right there, I'm nearly right. And I mean, that is just absurd. 
And we've, we've had this song, that I'm not even sure whether the Heathrow extension, where we got to on that, is this being litigated again? I mean, it's going to take forever. It's still, it's still in the courts, yes. Just still I in mean, the planning it, it, system. Yeah. We have to get over this sort of stuff. You know? And uh, the, the, you know, the, the failure to expand aviation is a, is a, is a classic example. So, yeah, the planning side, you know, make it, it's got to be easy to build, not goddamn near impossible. And it seems to be goddamn near impossible to build new runway capacity that we desperately need. Uh, and financial services would be the two big, big areas I would focus on. There might be other low hanging fruit, though, right? I'm, I'm told that they're going to um, um, substantially liberalize childcare, where you know, childcare is so colossally expensive that, you, you know, essentially you need to be affluent middle class high earning parents to realistically be able to afford it to make it worth you going to work because we've had all sorts of rules about ratios and all of the rest that they don't have uh, such strict rules on the continent and lo and behold childcare tends to be a lot cheaper in the rest of europe i think it's us and denmark are right at the top of the list so i think they'll liberalize things like the ratio or what counts as acceptable childcare, uh, and you know that will be a win but probably not completely transformative. It will be for some families. Wow, we can suddenly afford childcare rather than not affording childcare. Suddenly I can take this job rather than uh, one of us having to stay at home to look after the kids. It will be transformative for a good number of lives, but probably not in the same overall macro dramatic way for the economy that planning reform and financial services reform would be. Indeed, and I think that's where the big opportunities are going to come from in this regulatory side and and. Although, again, with some political difficulties there to think about. But if, if Trustnomics is going to succeed, uh, they're going to have to, uh, I suppose, push through. Thanks so much, Mark, for joining the IA podcast. Matt, great to have been with you. Thanks a lot. Been a good chat. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IA broadcast. 